So the Lord's Prayer, He taught them. He said, you pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then it goes like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray, or we, they were supposed to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's plan and purpose is for this earth. And so he taught them to pray that the kingdom will come and that the, the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven, I can say, would be like the spectators. Heaven would be the cloud of witnesses. The people that are looking towards us. But the playing field is the earth. The place where everything must take place is here. The place where God intended, intends to fulfill His purposes is here. And so that is what's amazing. If you start understanding God's plan and purpose, that He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's go to Hebrews 12. Thank you, Jesus. So the kingdom of God must come. So today is going to be very specific. <laughs> There is no rapture. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay, so that is the message of today. And I'm going to explain to you out of the scriptures that you can understand that uh, we've been deceived for years. Expecting a rapture of the church, running away, while Jesus said we will take over. <laughs> okay. So imagine we pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, and the kingdom of God comes, and then we go. So we, we, we actually encourage people to, to, to see God, to see His glory. We want God's kingdom to manifest, but at the same time, we're thinking, we can go anytime now. We're going to run any, anytime now. We're going to run away. It's a, it's a runaway mentality. While Jesus conquered on this earth with His own blood, purchased our lives with His own blood, conquered the devil, now we have to go hide in the caves again. Um, so Hebrews 12, it explains that we did not come to a terrible mountain that Moses was even afraid <laughs> when, when, when they were in the desert and God spoke, that even Moses was afraid. It says, we have not come to that mountain, but we have come. Now, my English teacher taught me that have come is past tense. <laughs> Thank you for the English speaking people that can help me in that. Have come means past tense, right? So, we have come to Mount Zion, even the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So, are we going to a city or have we come to a city? We have come to a city. And what city? The heavenly Jerusalem. So, as you are sitting here, you are a citizen of the heavenly Jerusalem and you have come to that city. It's not a place that you're going to. It's not a place in the Middle East. This heavenly Jerusalem is the city of God and you have come to that city. Okay? And to countless multitudes of angels, that explains some of our experiences, countless multitudes of angels in festal gathering, and to the church of the firstborn who are registered as citizens in heaven, and to the God who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect. Verse 24 explains it so nicely. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new agreement. Okay, testament. So now, did you come to Jesus? How many of you have come to Jesus? Then you also have come to all the rest. <laughs> it's as easy as that. If you have come to Jesus, then you have come to the judge, 
you have come to Jerusalem, you have come to the angels, you have come to Mount Zion, you have come because you have come to Jesus. If you have come to Jesus, you have come to all of the rest. Okay, so, but here's my point, listen. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new agreement, who speaks of better and more gracious things. Now, let me just continue. Verse 27, verse 26. Then at Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he has given a promise. Yet once more, I will shake and make tremble not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now this expression, yet once more, indicates the final removal and transformation of all that can be shaken. Now there's things that can be shaken... And it says that there will be a final removal and a transformation of that which can be shaken. That is of that which being created, which has been created, in order that what cannot be shaken may remain and continue. Okay, there's two words. What cannot be shaken must remain <laughs> and must continue. There's something that must remain. There's something that must continue that cannot be shaken. What is that? Listen to this. Let us therefore receiving a kingdom that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken. Offer. <laughs> Worship to God. Okay. So there's going to be a final removal of things that can be shaken. What will be removed? The things that can be shaken. What will remain? The kingdom. <laughs> and we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But there's things that will be shaken and removed. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay? So there's things that will be shaken and removed. But this kingdom cannot be shaken and cannot be moved. This kingdom will stay. This kingdom will remain. Okay. Having that in mind, let's just look at a few other verses explaining the kingdom. Matthew 10, verse 6. I wrote some scriptures down. I don't want to forget any of them. So normally, I don't use notes, but today I do. Matthew chapter 10. Concerning the kingdom. Jesus sent his disciples out and he said to them, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's close. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Okay, so he said, go and tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, at hand means very close. It's so close to you now. And this is going to be the sign that the, this, the kingdom of heaven is now very close to you. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. Now, I just want to say, what are things, according to Hebrews, just what we mentioned, there's things that can be shaken. What will be shaken? Sickness, death, poverty, and all that came in because of the fall of man. But what will remain? Or what will be shaken? The fact that you are just a natural man. The natural will be shaken. But the kingdom things will not be shaken. And so with you are in Christ, the new creation. And so whatever is not of God will be shaken. But God will not be shaken in his kingdom. And his kingdom, I'm going to get there. Where is his kingdom? Just wait. I'm going to get there. <laughs> Don't answer yet. <laughs> okay. Matthew 10 verse 6 says, The kingdom is at hand. It's close. It's very close. And you're going to see it when you see the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. When you see people getting healed, the dead being raised, it's going to tell you that the kingdom is now close. Not 2,000 years away, but close. Right? In their time when he spoke to them. Matthew 12 Verse 28. 
This is going to be so awesome. And how, what will this do for you? It will give you a future and a hope. Like, like Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Uh, the plans, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. When you understand the truth of these things, it will take all those false fears out and will give you direction in where you are heading. And that's why I have the series. Okay, so you're going to just have direction in life, purpose and destiny. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 12, verse 28. Now, the whole, before I read verse 28, maybe you did read it already. The whole thing is they said he's driving out demons by um, the help, it says, it says here, by the help of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, by the devil, right? And then he says, but if a kingdom is divided, it cannot stand. And it's an awesome thing he explains there. That the one kingdom brings light and life, and the other kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. And these kingdoms, and if the kingdom of light now gives some sickness also, this kingdom will not stand. There's just one kingdom, and there's one purpose. Okay? If the kingdom divided, if a kingdom is divided, it will not stand. Proving also that God doesn't bring sickness and death. That is the giver of life and healing. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. What I just said is so powerful. I said God doesn't bring sickness and death. He's the giver of life. And He's bringing healing to all people. Okay. The kingdom of light. But then He says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Before you expected it. <laughs> he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you before you even expected it. Because now I'm driving demons out, by, not by the help of the devil, but by God. And by the Spirit of God. And that shows you that the kingdom of God is, has come upon you before you even expected it. <laughs> okay. What is the kingdom? God's rule. God's domain. In this kingdom, He is the king. And we are the kings. Because Revelation says He's the king of kings. And so in this place, Jesus rules. And according to Romans uh, 5, it says that we are seated with Him. Or no, Ephesians 2, seated with Him in heavenly places. But Romans 5 says those who receive the gift of grace and righteousness will reign as kings in life. God's kingdom is His rule and authority. So, God's kingdom is when someone is blind, He opens the blind eye. It's a work of light. It's a work of the kingdom. <laughs> For instance, just one, but that's one. <laughs> okay. And so he's healing people, showing that the kingdom has come upon the people. It's very close. Okay? So the way he healed people, that's the thing. Luke chapter 17. So where is the kingdom? Luke chapter 17. Here is the answer. I just love this one. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Listen to this. Okay, so he, asked by, he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He replied to them by saying, The kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed. Like in, 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 in another way. Listen. Nor will people say, Look, here it is. Or see, it is there. Behold, now this is not true to these people. He says, because they asked him, how will the kingdom come? So the king, kingdom wasn't within them, but listen to his answer. The kingdom of God is within you and among you. But answering the question, how will the kingdom come? He said, the kingdom of God is within you and among you. <laughs> so he told them, the kingdom is not going to be observed by physical signs. Outside signs. It's going to be accompanied by miracles, but it's not going to come by signs like people used to think. The kingdom is going to come by certain signs. He says, no. This, don't go when it say, they say it's here. The kingdom of God is not here or there or coming from outside. The kingdom is within you and among you. Where is the kingdom of God? Within and among us. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus lives in me. 
The kingdom of God is wherever the king is. <laughs> I hope I can help you with that. I said the kingdom of God is wherever the king is present. His kingdom is within us because he's ruling in our hearts and he's living in us. Okay, so the prayer was answered. The kingdom came. This is just Martin is now speaking and sharing my heart. The prayer was answered. The kingdom came. When Jesus was crucified and was raised from the dead, the kingdom actually came. But now we are waiting for the manifestation of that kingdom. And that it will become more and more a reality in the lives of the people. So it's more like the kingdom came already. We're not actually waiting for it. It came. Because it was closed. But now it came. The kingdom came when Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Taking his place on his throne. Now the kingdom came. What did he do? He caused us to sit down with him in heavenly places. And now the kingdom came. And we are ruling with Jesus. Where do we rule? On this earth. With Jesus. Right? And so now his rule and authority must now be evident and seen on this earth. And so now the kingdom in a certain sense must still come visibly, but it comes through the church. As we know who we are and ruling and reigning with Christ because of grace. So we're not going to hide people. I'm sitting with Jesus on a throne. I'm not going for the caves. So what does that, where does that come from? The fact that there's going to be a time of great tribulation and then we're going to hide in the caves and women mustn't be pregnant in those days. It's going to be terrible and people say there's coming a third world war and this is going to be worse than ever before and oh. <laughs> okay. I hear you. I hear you. But when Jesus spoke to them, let's quickly go to that chapter. Let, just, just Matthew 24. Matthew 23 says the same thing, but let's just go to 24. I'm, not, I'm going to maybe have a whole session on the great tribulation. <laughs> so it's, it's going to take a whole session. But just Matthew 24, listen to this. Matthew 24. So he speaks to them, verse 34. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away Till all these things taken together take place. And so he's explaining there's going to be a great tribulation such as there's never been, such as there will never be again. And this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And then he turned to them and said, this generation will not pass away. Now if you were in their shoes, and he said this generation, would you have thought maybe another generation? Or would you have taken them seriously when he said this generation? But yet we read it 2,000 years later after he said this generation and we take it for this generation. And so he explained the generation. He said this generation will not pass away until all these things taken together take place. And so all those things took place. You can look at history. I did share a bit about it the previous session. I will do again uh, in the next uh, message. But the fall of Jerusalem, 70 AD, the whole of Jerusalem was destroyed. There was all those things happened. They hide in the caves. They were running away. People were killed. Babies were killed. It was terrible. It was a terrible, terrible time. And it was the great tribulation. The time of the great tribulation. And so that is a specific time. The Bible calls it birth pains of a new time. Birth pains. And so you are long past the birth pain. You are living in the kingdom. <laughs> okay. So, again, my message is not to explain the great tribulation. I will do it again in detail. All I want to say is this generation will not pass away until all these things taken together have taken place. Thank you, Jesus. And there will never again be a tribulation like that or time of suffering like that. You'll say, but people suffer in the world. Today, very like this, very bad things happening in the world. You're right. 
But just imagine, even World War II, it was tough, right? But just imagine in the Middle Ages. Have you read some of the history? And so, it's not going worse and worse. <laughs> it's, it's a false idea, thinking that the times is just getting worse and worse. It's not so. The church will have the right influence. If we know who we are, we can change situations and we can rule on this earth. That's why I believe revival is coming to this nation. That's why I believe South Africa will be the best place to live in. That's why I have confidence in what God said over this nation. I'm not thinking, oh, there's going to be darkness and darkness is going to cover the earth. All I'm thinking is the light has risen upon me and upon you. And so we're just going to bring light. The light of Jesus. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So the great tribulation happened to that generation that was there. And they did hide in the caves. And it was terrible to be pregnant in those days. And so forth and so forth. It is done. Okay? Great tribulation. Psh, finished. Done. Klaar. Gedoen. <laughs> okay. So now, let's now look at the rapture myth. And just see the rapture being raptured. Let's rapture your rapture today by the grace of Jesus. Okay. So let's go to Luke 17. We're coming back to Matthew 24 because it's the same scripture there. No, let's do Matthew 24 first. Sorry, 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 sorry. So Matthew 24 says, look at um, this generation will not pass away until all these things taken together take place. Then you see in verse 40, at that time, oh, people, this is awesome. This is really going to set your life on course. At that time, two men will be in the field. <laughs> okay. What time? The time of the great tribulation. And two men will walk in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken and one will be left. If you read the previous verse, it says, As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In this context. Not the coming. This coming is a different coming. The judgment that's upon Jerusalem. Jesus said, just quickly, Jesus said, sorry, I'm stuck with that. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you under my wings, but you would not. And then he explained the great tribulation, right? So Jesus said, I wanted to protect you, but this is coming upon you, Jerusalem. Who's, what, that's speaking to who? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you under my wings, but you would not. Then he, then he said all those things that's going to happen to Jerusalem, the Jews. And then he said, this generation will not pass away until all these things will happen. Okay? So, at that time, one of you, those people, will be taken and the other one will be left. And it will be like the days of Noah. Just think of it. Who was left on the earth and who was taken away in the days of Noah? The righteous remained. The unrighteous was removed. And so the connotation is the same as in the days of Noah. One will be left, one will be taken. Speaking of Noah and his group, his family that was left. And the, the people that was taken. But no, we made it like a little rapture theory. Like, we're going to be taken, shoo, and, and the rest will be left. And then we have those books left behind, you know. And with so much uh, fear instilled in the hearts of Christians all over the world. And we were so afraid, I should just not be left behind. From now on, if you hear what I'm saying today, say, I want to be left. But you, no one will even be taken now, because that was for that time. What does taken mean? Die. <laughs> it's never ever been a good thing. 
To be taken means you will die. One will die, one will survive. One will stay, one will be gone. So I'm not saying it's not a good thing. Okay? I'm saying it's not a good thing. One will die, one will live. In that time of the great tribulation, a few of those Jews that believed survived, and the others were just taken. They died. Okay, so let's look at Luke 17, just to make sure I'm not speaking of uh, wrongly. This morning I got this, and I'm telling you, maybe this is the first time I've heard it. Maybe someone preached it before, but I've never heard it. This is the very first time I've heard Luke 17 like this. Luke 17. So, this, it's the same Luke that says, the kingdom is within you. Same chapter. If you go to verse uh, 33. Thank you, Jesus. On that day, let him who is in the house stop with his belongings in the house, not come down to carry them away. Verse 31. And likewise, let him who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Okay, so it's speaking of Jerusalem, the same context. Then it says, whoever tries to preserve his life in that time, in that time,